Hi friends, welcome back to another episode of Generation Tech. My name is Alan. One of our viewers recently asked me whether nuclear weapons are used in Star Wars, and if they are used, why don't we ever get to see them? Good question. First, let's define what we're talking about. A nuclear weapon is an explosive device that releases a massive amount of energy, which comes from a reaction where atomic matter is either separated or fused together. These explosions are much larger and more powerful than traditional explosives and emit massive amounts of radiation and an electromagnetic pulse. On our planet here on Earth, they are considered the pinnacle of destructive power. The most powerful nuke detonated on Earth was the SAR bomb, which had a yield of over 50 megatons. If it were dropped over New York, the blast radius would reach well into New Jersey, and Midtown Manhattan would pretty much be gone. Now, as destructive as these weapons might seem to us, they're still considered relatively low-tech in the Star Wars galaxy. But of course, low-tech doesn't mean that they don't work or aren't used all the time. Like the baseball bat, the melee weapon that requires no prior training whatsoever. And so, like here on Earth in the Star Wars galaxy, many variants of nuclear weapons have been created by the various factions. The Mandalorians were known to use nuclear fission bombs like the one used by American forces over Hiroshima. Nuclear fission bombs are relatively weak when compared to their fusion counterparts, and they usually have a yield that is described in kilotons of TNT rather than megatons. The Mandalorian Neo-Crusaders, who started attacking the Republic almost 4,000 years before the Battle of Yavin, used silver missiles with nuclear warheads that had a blast radius of 30 kilometers and released heavy amounts of radiation damage in a 100 kilometer radius. The Mandalorians used these devastating missiles for orbital bombardment and destroyed the surface of the planet known as Serico. The warheads were also used in ship-to-ship -ship combat in space and could take out entire wings of starships and heavily damage a capital ship. During the Battle of Jebel, when a Rakgul plague was released on the planet's surface, Mandalorian leader Cassus Fett decided to bombard the entire planet with nukes in order to take out this highly contagious disease. Of course, there were also long-term side effects of nuclear weapons, especially when they were used in bulk. Massive amounts of radiation poured out of these bombs and rendered the target zone uninhabitable for long periods of time. Which actually is a desirable effect when you're facing a foe as fearsome as the Rackle. All you basically need is one of these guys to escape to start the plague all over again. The Mandalorian's own homeworld of Mandalore was full of radioactive deserts that no longer could sustain life thanks to their excessive use of nukes. It was also said that the Hut's original homeworld of Varl had been rendered uninhabitable by their use of nuclear weapons as well. By the time of the Battle of Yavin, though, nuclear weapons were a lot more rare and generally only seen in the Outer Rims and more remote areas. Repeated volleys of fire from turbo lasers could easily do as much damage as a nuke for a much lower cost and with much lower residual radiation levels. Although it should be mentioned that the Empire still manufactured nuclear weapons to be used as sort of terror weapons against uh, planets that they didn't care about irradiating. The Rebels did manage to steal one of these nukes from an Imperial freighter and planted it inside of a Star Destroyer called the Invincible, and the blast was powerful enough to completely vaporize the entire ship. Now, there are also much less traditional types of nuclear weapons that were also used in the Star Wars galaxy. The Empire, for instance, also had access to an antimatter bomb. Antimatter is essentially the opposite of regular matter. It has an opposite charge and rotation, and when it encounters matter, it is annihilated. It only takes one gram of antimatter to create an explosion that is similar in size to a nuclear fission bomb. Luckily, antimatter is found in extremely small amounts, and our own scientists have only created nanograms of the substance. So we should be fine, but interestingly enough, antimatter is found in minuscule amounts all around us. For instance, a banana produces a tiny amount of antimatter every hour or so, which is why old bananas have black spots on them and can be used as explosive devices. But yeah, antimatter bombs are no joke, and they can produce explosions that have a much wider blast radius, which makes them very useful in the wide expanses of deep space. Another more commonly used weapon in the Star Wars galaxy, known as the proton torpedo, can also be considered a weapon that uses a nuclear reaction. But unlike a normal nuclear fission reaction where a nucleus is shot at an atom, this is a proton being shot at a proton. If you remember physics class in high school, most atoms in the world are balanced and at their center is an equal amount of neutrons and protons. 
But in theory, you could also create a reaction where two protons are attracted to each other and fuse. This is basically how our sun works. This obviously creates a much larger amount of energy and power. Now, we're not really exactly sure if this is how the Star Wars proton torpedoes work, but these proton torpedoes are clearly extremely powerful weapons and more commonly used than traditional nukes. It's no wonder that during the Galactic Civil War, the Empire put tight restrictions on proton torpedoes, making it almost impossible for non-imperial military to purchase legally. Then on a smaller scale, apparently thermal detonators also had nuclear reactions inside of them, usually using the rare volatile element known as viridium as a fuel source for a fusion reaction. There are definitely limitations to how small you can make a nuclear device, but I guess it is physically possible to have something fit inside of a detonator-sized explosive. Their explosion does seem a bit underwhelming in movies to be a true nuclear device, but who knows? Now, I've never seen a nuke go off in person, so I'm not exactly an authority on the matter. So why aren't weapons that have a nuclear reaction more commonly used in Star Wars? Well, for one, they are definitely not the most powerful weapons in the galaxy. First, there are super lasers like the Death Star 1 and 2, which could vaporize entire planets, something that would be pretty difficult to do even with the 20,000 nukes we have on our own planets. Interesting fact, the Kyber Crystal Reactor on the Death Star was designed with the premise of it being used to create unlimited energy. The Kyber Crystal could take energy in and actually amplify it, which means it's a reaction that creates more energy than what you initially put in. Galen Erso was initially motivated to work on this project because he thought it could end poverty across the entire galaxy. But then there are cheaper and more deadly options like using a tractor beam, for instance, to pull an asteroid into a planet or a moon. This uses the target's own gravitational field against itself and could cause far more damage than a traditional nuke. Just ask the Legends version of Chewie, who was crushed by a moon that was dragged onto a planet by the Yuzang Vong. Kinetic weapons are cheap and simple to make, and our own government has been experimenting with them since Vietnam. The Lazy Dog projectile was a two inch long piece of steel with stabilizing fins. Dropped from 3,000 feet, each projectile could reach a speed of 500 miles per hour and penetrate nine inches of concrete. It had a similar effect to firing a 50 cal but vertically at a target, and the result of such attacks were often extremely gruesome. Then there was Project Thor. This included the use of tungsten steel rods that were 20 foot long and one foot wide in diameter. These would be stationed on satellites in orbit. The impact speed of these rods was projected at Mach 10, and potentially could have as much explosive power as a small tactical nuke. They were pretty much impossible to intercept. Thankfully, this program was never greenlit because it was considered too expensive and impractical to fly up these heavy tungsten steel rods. Which is good because our Air Force does occasionally lose and drop munitions by accident. Then there were turbo lasers. As we mentioned before, they had a pretty high firing rate and a ridiculous amount of firepower that can dish out as much damage as a nuke after repeated firing. Turbo laser ammunition was stored in gas form and took up far less space than nuclear projectiles as well, which is important in longer skirmishes where you don't want to run out of bullets. Nuclear weapons also released a lot of radioactive waste, and depending on the type of weapon, this could last for years to centuries. I imagine once any species becomes spacefaring, they'll begin to realize just how few habitable planets there are in the galaxy. It's very possible that nukes were banned in Republic space after the Rusan Reformation. Just like landmines, flamethrowers, gas weapons, and cluster bombs here on Earth, nukes in the wider galaxy might be seen as immoral and completely illegal to use. From a more strategic point of view, nuclear weapons were expensive to create and oftentimes required rare materials to build. Storing them could be dangerous and could also require special types of protection. And even when nuclear weapons were used, they were mostly designed for in-atmosphere operations, where there was plenty of air pressure for an explosion shockwave to travel through. This meant they were less effective in space, where the most important battles are fought. Although the resulting radiation should still be quite deadly, but it seems like in Star Wars, most of the ships are shielded from gamma rays and other cosmic rays. The MP from the nuke would be a larger problem and could play havoc on a starship's systems. As we saw during the Battle of Scarif, if you can disable a ship's engines, then you'll find yourself in an advantageous position. But in space, the range of an EMP and the radioactive waves are much wider and could potentially damage friendly ships and even your own ship. 
Another disadvantage a nuclear weapon had when compared to something like a turbo laser was that they usually required some kind of engine or propulsion system to fly them onto target, which made them vulnerable and easy to take out. So as you can see, in an advanced society, nuclear weapons are rarely ever used because they're just a bit too antiquated. And if you look at our own world, we don't use nuclear weapons because they're just too devastating and they're too dangerous to use. We much rather rely on more precise weapons that have limited collateral damage. And I guess because Star Wars is supposed to be uh, a more advanced galaxy than our own, you can see that they're trending in that direction as well. Unless you count the Death Star and Star Killer base. But still, you get the point. Anyway, guys, don't forget to subscribe and hit that notification button so you don't miss out on the rest of our awesome content. And as usual, thanks for joining us today. If you're watching this, you are Generation Tech.